Hello. Um, Twitch uses a lot of Go for our backend services, and so I have an opportunity to see how the runtime acts for a wide variety of, of different kinds of software that we end up writing with it. Um, there's a, a tool that was uh, the, the execution tracer that's been added in Go 1.5 a bit over a year ago, greatly improved in um, 1.7 that I've been using a lot lately to diagnose issues in people's programs. Um, and it's way underdocumented and way underused, and I'd like you all to know more about it. Um, so it's documented a tiny, tiny bit in the runtime trace package. It's the Go execution tracer. Um, it is uh, effectively instrumentation built into, uh, built into the runtime, built into the scheduler, so you can see when Go routines are created, when they start running, stop running, send on channels, uh, receive data over the network, when GCs happen. Uh, it, it has a ton of information there because it's built into the runtime. Um, and you can analyze it with the Go tool trace command. Well, what does that say? Um, it's for trace files, and it uh, opens a web browser. And there's, there's very little extra information there, and um, you're kind of on your own until now. Um, so I'm going to uh, give an overview of how to use the tool through three work demos of uh, issues that I've encountered in, in our apps and debugged using this tool. Uh, first of all, there's a timing-dependent bug. Um, then I I'll show the sorts of problems that it's not great at solving um, and ways that it complements the other tools that you might be more familiar with, like PProf. Um, and finally, a latency bug that I uh, discovered in the GC and is fixed in 1.7 um, with the help of this tool. Um, so first of all, canceling requests. Uh, the, uh, when Samir Ajmani introduced the context package in 2014, he made it fairly clear that it's about uh, propagating cancellation signals through your application, and that we also want to propagate that cancellation signal um, between processes. And so if we decide that we don't need some of these RPC responses, then uh, our app at the front end will say, like, cancel that request. And then on the other end, um, the, the first layer of back end will receive that cancellation signal. Using the context package, will pass that through to its outbound calls. And then finally, the far, far back ends will get the signal that, there's, uh, that their information is no longer needed. Um, so we've had a, an internal RPC helper package um, uh, internally for a few years to do this, um, which uh, is built on top of the net HTTP package so we can tie the life cycle of inbound HTTP requests to a context value and the context value to outbound HTTP requests so that the cancellation signals flow all the way through. Um, it predates um, 1.7's inclusion of context in the standard library and so it has a couple different ideas about how, uh, how the context propagation, uh, how the cancellation signals should be propagated. Um, uh, in the standard library, when your HTTP handler returns, um, then the context gets canceled. For ours, we also tie into the closed notifier so that we can tell when the caller has gone away. Um, and we also, con we also cancel the context then. Um, however, we had this weird bug that would show up occasionally where one of our deep, deep backends would decide on its own that its data was no longer needed and would return an error, which would then bubble back up. Um, so that's, that's clearly no good. Um, and so when faced with this kind of uh, occasional timing-dependent bug, we could add log lines all throughout the app and kind of guess as to what the problem is and where we should insert logs. Um, or we could collect all of the data that could possibly be of use for solving this problem and then sift through it with the trace tool. Um, so um, we can import the trace package, um, start it with an IO writer, um, write it to disk maybe. Um, or if you, you may already be using PProf, exposing the, uh, the HTTP handlers, and if so, you may be ready to get execution traces from your applications in production right now. Um, so we collect an execution trace, um, download it, run it with the command. Sure enough, browser opens, we get this sort of UI. Um, we're gonna spend most of our time in the first link view trace, uh, which looks a bit like this. Time goes from left to right, uh, there's a time scale on the top. This is about four seconds of data. Um, below that, there's an indication of the heap size. Uh, the garbage collector has run five times, each time returning memory to the app. 
Below that, there's uh, the number of Go routines that are ready to run and the number of threads that are currently executing those Go routines. Um, then there's lines for inbound, uh, inbound network data, uh, timers triggering, syscalls returning, uh, and then for each processor, what Go routines was it running at each time. Uh, you can also press question mark to get a ton of help text. There's hours of entertainment in here, um, but the most important for now is that you can use WASD keys to pan and zoom, kind of like a video game. Um, so the way that we've collected this, uh, this data, we stopped the collection when we triggered the bug. And so we kind of scroll all the way to the end and, uh, and see what's going on there. Um, and so we have, a few, we have a few Go routines that are running in response to a request coming in over the network. Um, this is 330 microseconds across the screen from left to right, and there's a huge amount of detail here. Um, if we were running pprof, it would check in on each thread 100 times a second and to see what it was doing right then, and then it would average all those together. And so we don't get this kind of information um, unless we have something like the execution tracer that is hooked into the runtime to get this information. Uh, so we can uh, click on one of the uh, we can click on one of the Go routine spans and uh, see more information about it when it started running, how long it ran, links to other Go routines, the stack when it stopped running. Um, but the Go routine IDs here are kind of interesting. Um, G18 is a timer process. The request came in on 466. Um, there are a number of sequential, sequentially numbered Go routines in the 600s, which were started in response to this request coming in over the network. And then there's this one in the 500s, which is neither very new nor very old. So we can search for the last time this Go routine ran to see what it's up to. Um, use the slash to search and then F to focus in on the last selection. And we find that 750 milliseconds earlier, that Go routine was running. Um, and the, the function that it's running is called close notify await activity read. Um, and that it stopped because it was blocked on reading data from the network. Um, so this, is, this, this gives us some hints as to what might be going on. Um, and also, 750 milliseconds is special for this app because that's what we've set for the read timeout in, uh, when we created the HTTP server. Um, and so armed with this information, we can, uh, we can look very specifically at parts of NetHttp package. And um, from, from there, we learn that uh, when you use HTTP 1.1 keep alive connections and a read timeout and close notifier, um, th those, those three features don't work terribly well together. Um, that first of all, when the previous handler returns, then and only then is the timeout set. And, so, and it's not reset when new data comes in over the network until the next handler returns. And so we found ourselves in this kind of awkward position where we have read a complete request from the network, we started handling it, and then microseconds later, we get, this, we get the signal that apparently the, the sender doesn't need the data anymore. So, oops. Uh, but now we know how to solve the bug. Um, next one is a, an application that um, got some hints from the execution tracer, but relied on other tools to actually get to the bottom of it. Here's an application that looks, looks quite different. Um, all of the threads are busy all of the time. And this, by the way, is supposed to be an interactive application, responding very quickly to, to data coming, on, coming in over the network. Um, but it's, it's entirely saturated. There's also a lot of blue going on there. Um, so we can zoom in on one of the um, individual processor rows um, and see that on the top half, there's user code in Go routines. Um, below that, there's uh, things that the, that the processor is doing on behalf of the runtime. Um, one of those is syscalls. This might be sending data on the network. Um, and then there's also sweep in order to help the GC. In modern versions of the Go runtime, the, uh, the garbage collection runs concurrently with the application, which is kind of a bet that it will finish finding all of the memory that it can release before the application um, allocates way, way, way too much and gets itself killed by the OS. Um, so it's, it's kind of an interesting competition, but the game is basically rigged because both the garbage collector and memory allocation are handled by the runtime. And so if an app is allocating too much memory, the, uh, it can be forced to help the GC. It can either help with the mark during the mark phase um, in order to find memory that's reachable, um, or it can help in sweep to find memory that is no longer reachable. 
Um, and here we see that it's doing sweep work. Uh, we can click on one of those spans and see that, indeed, there's a call to runtime make slice, um, which, which uh, triggered the, the sweep work. Um, so this application really needs to allocate less memory. It's the classic advice when you have a GC problem. If, you're, if the GC is giving you trouble, use it less, allocate less memory. And so this is a time that we need to um, break out pprof uh, to find where we're allocating all this memory. Um, and sure enough, there's plenty of room for improvement. And so if we check in a few weeks later, it looks rather different. Um, first of all, there's a ton of white space um, of, of the process not being saturated, and so it's able to be more responsive to incoming network events, which is great for this app. Um, and the other thing is that it's, um, that a lot of the Go routines stop running because they're waiting on a, on a global lock to send stats D metrics. Um, and so if we go back to the top level index of the Go tool trace output, um, one of the links is to an SVG that lets us see how much time we're spending in various locking primitives. Um, and out of this two second profile, all of the Go routines spent more than five seconds waiting on that single lock. And so that might be a good place to, uh, to optimize next. Um, however, sometimes it is the GC. GC bugs are fairly uncommon, um, but they're not all gone. Um, so if you, if you see one, say something, please. Um, and th this is one that I ran into during the 1.7 development cycle. Um, here's a third app. Um, you can see that there's a GC that happened because memory is, is released. Um, but if we zoom in on the garbage, collections, uh, the garbage collection cycle there, um, we see a couple undesirable things. One is that the number of Go routines that are ready to run doesn't really decrease much. And so Go routines are presumably uh, sitting around waiting to be run, but there aren't processors available to run them. Uh, the other is that there's this nine millisecond delay between data coming in over the network and the, the Go routine receiving that data actually being scheduled, getting CPU time. And nine, mil nine milliseconds is about three or three orders of magnitude more than is usual for this app. So there's something bad going on here. Um, scrolling down, we see that there's a particular kind of Go routine that usually takes only 50 microseconds to do its work. During the garbage collection, it takes 900 microseconds. Later on in the GC, it takes 200 microseconds, and then afterwards it's back to 50. It's the same kind of Go routine doing the same work but taking a vastly different amount of time. What, what could possibly be going on here? Right, I checked the issue tracker, um, found something that looked kind of related, um, pasted some screenshots kind of like these, uh, uh, just kind of getting to know the tool, finding my way around there. Um, and it turns out that it is uh, related to the other form of, of assistance that apps can be forced to do. Um, the, the, the points are that allocation is in direct opposition to the goals of the garbage collector. The garbage collector is trying to find all the memory that's reachable. The app is trying to make there be more reachable memory. So in order to pay for this, the application has to assist the garbage collector or steal someone else's credit. However, at the beginning of the garbage collection, there's no, like, none of the Go routines have done any work, and so there isn't any available to steal. Also, if you do work, uh, you need to do a worthwhile amount of work. Um, it's, you don't want to, uh, if you allocate like eight bytes, um, it's not really worthwhile to do eight bytes of work to help the GC. You want to do like a significant amount. However, um, this was a bit mistuned, and so a significant amount meant 12 megabytes. So if you allocate eight bytes, you're on the hook for 12 megabytes of work. And this takes, you know, about nine milliseconds for the app to do, um, which is a big deal for this particular program. Um, so I um, wrote a change to fix this, and after it got merged, um, it looks kind of like this. Um, and so there are, there's fine bands of many Go routines running for only the small amount of time that they need. Uh, for 50 microseconds early in the GC, 50 microseconds late in the GC, 50 microseconds after the GC. Um, so the tool that does all this stuff is Go Tool Trace, um, and you may be able to get the data from your apps right now 
at the deb debug pprof trace endpoint, um, if you, which should be available if you have pprof imported. Um, I'm, I have a blog post coming out fairly soon, um, maybe in a couple weeks, for uh, more details on the GC bug in particular. Um, so what is the execution tracer good for? Um, it can help you see time-dependent bugs in your programs. It complements the other profiles. It doesn't replace them. You'll still use pprof. pprof is like probably the go-to first thing for like what's the app doing. Execution tracers is a good way to complement that. Um, and finally, it's really helpful for finding latency improvements in your applications. Um, maybe if you have several Go routines that are uh, that need to work to process a, a user request, um, you can find problems without their being scheduled. Um, so I'd like, you to, I'd like to encourage you to be prepared for the ways that your apps can need you by learning the tools ahead of time. Um, you have plenty of time now, presumably. Um, take them for a spin, see what's up, um, know how to use them. Doctors learn how to read charts and interpret lab results before they're relied upon to, to help their patients survive. And uh, we can do the same for our applications. So thank you. <laughs>